Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for the event, and I welcome you. We have a really interesting webinar on tap today, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of it, you will be able to access it on demand later on. We'll be sending out a link post-event in an email that will take you right to the webinar. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question for either of our panelists today, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll take a few minutes near the end of the webinar and go through the questions. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is why value stream management is essential for effective DevOps. Our speakers today are Jeff Key Kais. I almost did it, Jeff. I'm so sorry. I was like, I know his last name. I know how to pronounce it. Jeff Kais, Director of Product Marketing at Plutora, and Mark Hornbeek, who is Principal Consultant for DevOps at Trace3. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Charlene. Thanks for having us. <laughs> no problem. Jeff, Mr. Kais, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and let you do your thing. You bet. You know, just to kind of frame the conversation today in diving through value stream management, it's a little bit new. So we thought we would walk through a bit of, of what are value stream maps and, and what does it mean to manage value streams and ultimately get to the most important question. Why does this really matter? And then grilled through the next step of things of how is it done and what's needed to really realize a, a value stream management solution. And what's wonderful about this is Mark has been working with customers uh, really all over the uh, all over the place on helping improve value stream delivery. And so, Mark, your perspective is phenomenal in, in discussing the application of value stream mapping to customers. Hey, Jeff. <clears throat> Thanks for the introduction, Charlene. Uh, yeah, I, I'm quite impressed with this whole concept of value stream management. I've been working with quite a few clients over the years uh, in both public sector as well as you know, enterprise and manufacturers and um, service providers. And without a doubt, you know, you know, DevOps is all about really the culture and getting people to work together between Dev and Ops and everything in between. And meanwhile, continuous delivery is a lot about you know, the mechani mechanics under the hood that makes it all work, the tool chains and all of that. But the big missing piece is what, you know, is at the crux of the culture, the people, and um, the continuous delivery mechanisms. Something has to tie it all together. And it's a lot of information, basically, and information management problems. Uh, and value stream management uh, is really, you know, a direct solution to that problem of all the information that people have to deal with and um, coordinating uh, information across the pipeline and between the different uh, portions of the culture. So, um, you know, value stream management really is derived from value stream mapping, which is a visualization technique born out of lean manufacturing methodologies. Uh, the general idea is you, as a, a cross-functional team, map out the stages in your pipeline of the value stream from everything from planning through to operations and everything in between, you use that map to you know, collaboratively identify bottlenecks so that you can then focus on those bottlenecks to make improvements. Um, so fundamentally, you know, so software <clears throat> value stream maps are at the heart of the idea of uh, value stream management. Uh, and all the information flow and optimization of that information flow from beginning to end and back again uh, across the, the map. So I would say, you know, there is a, um, you know, real added value with this concept of value stream management, uh, where not only are you um, you know, just making things visible, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be made visible and management tools can help tie all that together. It essentially provides like a top level over and above traditional, you know, DevOps concepts of culture and, uh, and delivery pipelines. It provides um, essentially decision 
in actions, a decision and action layer that in and of itself can be automated or at least facilitated much better than if it's done manually. Uh, some examples of that are the way governance is done um, and generally speak, uh, notifications of uh, activities that are occurring across the pipeline as uh, the value stream is operating. And it provides lots of insights through analytics. Um, some of those insights are not at all obvious until you know, the data is aggregated and uh, sifted and presented and filtered. Uh, and value stream management provides all those kinds of capabilities. In addition to um, just, if you like, providing visibility, it's all about orchestration as well. What do you do with the information when you have it? So uh, while CICD tools automate uh, processes and activities such as, you know, build, test, deploy, uh, what do you do with the rest of the information that's really not part of the CICD pipeline itself? So orchestrating planning, for example, orchestrating the information coming back from post-deployment operations, orchestrating activities within the pipeline that are harder to do in an automated fashion. And, and even though in many environments, uh, you know, there's a goal to automate everything, in reality, you know, very few organizations have actually accomplished that. Uh, so there's often still some manual tasks such as test environment orchestration that are required to be supported. And the value stream management layer can actually um, provide that and facilitate uh, test environment orchestration by operationalizing the workflow for test environment setups, for example. Right. You know, because at the end of the day, we're all here to go faster. We're all here to deliver applications and solutions better than we have in the past and make it be as automated and, and as high quality as possible. So looking at this thing, using these lean manufacturing techniques, it changes the scope. It's It's not just about uh, you, you, how many check-ins can I do? How much how much code can I wring out of the system? But there's a much bigger way of looking at that. So really uh, digging into the story of value stream management as you know, having value stream mapping be a part of that, looking at the orchestration, looking at how the, the activities and so forth go across, why is this so important and what does it actually mean? I love the report that came from Dora, they called it the J curve of transformation and how so many people doing digital transformation have been really seeing some great initial successes and then hit a point where they actually drop down after those initial wins to a point to where they are are stuck and, and they're getting hit with this mountain of technical debt because everything that was there before is now well, frankly, um, I, you know, it, it's now another, it's legacy, it's it's technical debt. And so I, I remember hearing a, a customer of ours, a prospect actually said, you know, we've been doing DevOps for 18 months and have yet to ship anything. I remember thinking I'm somewhere there's a problem here. And they were discussing the problems that were going on because here's this new quote unquote DevOps process and it's not actually getting through delivery because it's got all these different problems. And and it wasn't about the automation. It was everything else. Hey, you, Jeff, you, maybe I could chime in on that a little bit. I mean, yes. A really good uh, graphic and it's something that I, I relate to very much. I mean, definitely pretty much every consulting engagement I've seen results in uh, a quite a list of things that need to be you know, implemented and worked on in order to really accomplish even the first way of DevOps continuous flow for even a single application. Uh, it's a long list and it can be overwhelming. Uh, even when, once folks really you know, embrace the list and start building it, you know, at some point there's a level of information overload and um, to get over that overload, it really is helpful to have something like value stream management in place to um, you know, take care of all that information and start making use of it as an asset rather than just having to deal with deal with it as a problem. Right, exactly. So in in driving through this, there's really four basic reasons why to to look at this. 
I pulled this graphic from a talk from Enterprise Summit this last year from Barclays, where uh, Jonathan Smart was talking about, he, he called it the urgency paradox. And looking, and he built this slide up where he was looking at the different stages of application delivery and, and how much time was being spent in the business case, the details, waiting for approvals, the product backlog. Uh, it, a business case was made that the feature was going to be delivered. And once that was, and, and all the, the analysis that was done, the design, and by the time it hit dev, now it's urgent. and and so much happening but once dev was done with it well now it's waiting for integration and they they spent you know uh, they only delivered uh, at the time on a monthly cadence so it had to wait for integration to get put together there and and all these different processes that were um, outside of of the actual writing the code and dev would celebrate themselves. Yay, we're so freaking agile um, because all that's working well. The whole point was, you know, from a theory of constraints point of view, you've got to look at where uh, where the the slow points are in the process and and how what's important to do here is to to look at the entire delivery process as a system. And unless you can see the whole thing, um, you're you're not going to be able to make improvements. And so the reasons why to do value stream management is because normally in most delivery pipelines, you have fragmented visibility along the, uh, along the application delivery pipeline. You've got really good visibility in your CI. You've got really good visibility into the deployment frequency. You've got good visibility when it gets done. You'll have visibility on the analysis side. But frankly, all the steps in between, it's hard to see those wait periods. And, and if you can't see it, you can't manage it. Mark, is this kind of what you're saying too? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was working with an insurance company not long ago, and you know, similar to many others, uh, we did a value stream mapping exercise. And uh, you know, at the beginning of the exercise, I asked folks, "How long is your, you know, value stream from software creation through to deployment?" And I got answers. They were all over the map, but uh, no matter who I asked, whether it was you know dev end, ops end, or people in the middle. Uh, the answers were far smaller than the reality that we worked out after we really built the value stream of activities. And it's, it's, there's an aha moment, in fact, <laughs> that occurs when you do a value stream map, typically, where everybody looks at it and says, oh, my God, we didn't realize all of these things that are actually involved to get from you know, code uh, plan to deployment and through to operations. Uh, it, it, it's a pretty much consistent across the board and yeah. that's really the value like how do you how do you correct something and improve it out of devops you know second way third way uh, unless you really know what you've got yeah that's really true and you know if you haven't done a value stream mapping exercise highly recommend it just one will change your view of how the process works you, you'll start to see things you never looked at before <clears throat> so the second big thing of why to look at value stream mapping is really addressing the portfolio itself. It's really cool to be able to look at any one pipeline and start to drill in, but frankly, the, the Achilles heel of application delivery in the enterprise are dependencies, because it's not that I've got one little microservice that ships in isolation and I can deliver brand new, huge functionality with one microservice or one little web page. It's there's going to be cross section, you know, a, a cross swipe across the portfolio of applications that all have to work together in aggregate. If you imagine a banking application, it's going to deliver a new credit card, for example. Well, they've got backend systems that are likely a system of record on the mainframe that are, um, uh, you know, even waterfall. They've uh, there are um, applications, there, there might be a mobile app and a web app, and all these things have to get delivered together as, as part of the value that gets delivered to the customer of that new functionality. So, and when you look at what's happening in the enterprise, Organizations are implementing CI/CD and and the workflows and release orchestration. The agile practices are happening, but yet tracking that work in aggregate is still missing. Looking at it across the portfolio of here's the different you know sets of stuff. It's it's almost like well ignore those pipelines. We 
We don't talk to those people. Huh? You can't really do that. You got to look at everything. And, you know, additional to that is looking at the work in progress. How do you track and make sure that you're limiting that work in progress and, and doing just the right amount? Then, um, and, and aligning that back to the business is the final piece that's missing because without that visibility, you have no idea what's really being delivered until the end, until one of those major checkpoints of, of we, we said we wanted to put this into the system and well, let's look at the end and see what came out. So lack of, you know, trying to track the visibility at that portfolio level is a really big deal. And Mark, I know you were, had some examples of that. <clears throat> well, you know, in general, the, a lot of um, a lot of the works on CI/CD often depict a single pipeline, as if that's the ultimate goal. But in reality, it's usually uh, not quite that simple. There's a pipeline for the data. There's a pipeline for you know the application code. There's even a pipeline of activities for things like the code that goes into infrastructure. So depending on how a company is organized. Those all can be literally separate pipelines that have interdependencies in order to deliver an actual service uh, that's working. And like you mentioned, it gets even more interesting when you have microservices and uh, there are services that need to essentially be delivered uh, together in order to accomplish the, the ultimate purpose of those services. Uh, so the management and orchestration of multiple pipelines and getting visibility uh, for microservices, you know, the data pipelines, infrastructure, things like test information to decide whether the aggregate set of services are going to meet some release goals, for example. All of that is critical and it's often forgotten and it's not really well covered in a, a lot of the published material. Absolutely. That's uh, that's spot on. And the whole point, you got to bring these things together. The <clears throat> the third big area of why value stream management is recognizing that we're we're in a shift. No longer are we in a world where we can believe that every pipeline will be the same. We now live in a world where in every company of delivering software, we have to get used to the idea that there is a hybrid of everything, a hybrid of types of applications and changes to those applications that get released, uh, a hybrid of methodologies, technologies, architectures, whatever that kind of thing is, it's going to follow a different kind of process. It's going to follow, uh, you know, each team is going to have a different style. And the idea that at some point in time we'll reach this mecca where every team is the same is about as much of a wish as hoping that every car on the freeway will be exactly the same and, and follow the same kind of patterns. It's just not going to happen. What we need to do when we're managing the value stream is to take a different kind of approach. We need to create the highway and allow cars of all sizes and shapes you know, uh, travel down that highway just fine. We need to not sign off and decide for ourselves that, well, those people, are, those kinds of releases, we don't really think about. At the end of the day, we need to manage the value streams, manage the application delivery, regardless of the technologies, architectures, regardless of the methodologies that's being followed, even the geography. All these things work together because we have to collaborate across these different delivery pipelines and methodologies. Without managing them all, uh, first, you've got to see it, then you got to manage it, and then you can start to optimize those types of pipelines. The biggest impact for change in any organization is the ability to show management of some pipelines in comparison to others and show that they are doing better because it's the influence to help uh, help guide that. Are you are you seeing this problem, Mark, of of multiple methodologies and struggle and companies struggling to uh, combine them together? Uh, you know, the single biggest reason I believe that uh, DevOps projects tend to fail is essentially what this diagram is saying. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of complex information. You might say, "Well, I'd like to take my team aside and just implement a DevOps pipeline." That's generally not the reality. You, you also have a, a lot of other business priorities going on at the same time. So there are complexities in terms of the urgency of, that's like you mentioned, patches and changes, carrying on with your current environment while you're developing a new one. Uh, so in the end, you know, the estimates for implementing your DevOps initiative tend to be 
too short, and then you have to justify why it's taking longer. Well, the reason is you've got all these other things going on, but if you don't have the information available to explain what happened or what's happening, you know, it's pretty hard to manage it. And then, you know, it's hard to justify doing, you know, even continuing the project, let alone getting on to the next phase of the project. So this is a crux of the matter. I mean, if you can provide, you know, a system that really, you know, gathers all the right information so you keep track of everything, even while you're implementing a DevOps initiative, then, you know, it's very, very powerful. And that's what, you know, value stream management offers. And unless you are, uh, you know, one other big point here too is it, unless you really understand the compliance, security, and budget of the legacy pipelines, how on earth are you going to ever gain trust that the DevOps pipelines will be able to follow those same kinds of things? It, the culture is uh, push down the trust into the individual teams. Well, make sure there, it's possible to do. The the fourth big reason of of why value stream management to the enterprise really gets into continuous improvement. The, uh, the adage is if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. You know, you can't manage what you can't see. So you've got to get the metrics. You've got to get the the kind of data and correlate it together. You, you've got to be able to see these things and you need a system of how to make improvements. Uh, you need to be able to see what are my biggest problems now where, where should I go automate? There's so much to do that the minute that you go down this path of, of digital transformation, in essence, it's not that everything is legacy, it's that your processes are legacy. Continue, it's not just a simple meeting, well, let's see what's wrong. It's a continuous process of improvement. The challenge that most organizations face though, that as you start answering some questions about, okay, well, let's gather some metrics. Let's gather some analytics on on our application delivery, but there's complications of gathering metrics because as soon as you do, people know what they're going to get measured by. Well, let's let's measure on check-ins a day. Well, guess what? People can start gaming that now. They'll they'll start checking in 20 times a day with little things that maybe don't matter. Um, once I start capturing a bunch of data, now I run into another problem of data overload, and I need to have a method of dealing with that so I can know what's important. When I ask the question about how, how do I correlate data across these different, how to normalize it, if you will. Well, now I've got a complication of how does that relate to uh, other systems that as they go in. I've, I've got to have storage and reporting across this. I've got to understand how and where I invest my efforts. And there's really one fundamental aspect to doing that, which is looking at um, uh, the process of doing a value stream mapping exercise and implementing um, uh, value stream management as part of the process. And I think this is where, you, Mark, you were going to talk about an application of, of, you know, the process of doing this. Yeah, this is a very recent uh, effort that I was involved in. Uh, it was actually a government application and um, the general idea was similar to what I mentioned before at the start of the effort. You know, the folks involved didn't realize how long it was taking to get a release out. It was a uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, system involved and uh, trying to speed up the value stream from two, uh, essentially two weeks. And uh, But when we mapped it all out, it became pretty clear that a lot of the effort and time that was being spent had to do with just processing information. So emails, meetings, a lot of manual tasks, and trying to make sure that the, there's enough of an audit trail for governance and get some visibility. Uh, it's got to be part of the solution. And uh, also the test environment uh, was manually orchestrated. The approval process was taking a long time. It was, again, very manual. And the deployment was manual. But the majority of the, you know, of the, Future value stream solution had to do with just uh, doing a more uh, integrated job of dealing with all the information. So eliminate emails, operationalize that process and the approval processes. And uh, the automation of some of the tasks actually turned out in this case to be not as critical in terms of shortening time as it was just to, to uh, automate the information flow and automate the approval processes to ensure that you've got and you know the audit trail for governance purposes as well as speeding up the overall process and eliminate wasteful delays between meetings and things of that nature 
Absolutely. So let's move on to well, how do you how do you actually do this? What how do you get value stream management and and what happens for it? So <clears throat> you know if you if you look at it from a high level, you you've got to combine value stream management with your DevOps and agile practices. And there's some fundamental pieces of bringing these uh, chunks together, if you will, into uh, into an overall solution to manage your application delivery. And we're going to go through those in in a bit more detail here. <clears throat> you know, if you if you start at the high level, um, uh, you've really got to uh, you know go back to Forrester's definition. I think they've done the best job of defining this. There's a Elevate Agile plus DevOps report that they provided, and in that report, they talked about a number of different aspects that they then included in the Forrester wave. And these aspects are really interesting. Um, things like managing the different tools in the ecosystem and uh, the governance that's included in there. It, value stream management is more than just value stream mapping, but you ought to be able to do some kind of mapping of the value stream itself and then get into the analysis and the visualizations, um, uh, nailing that with the analytics to give you the ability to follow your nose. Um, and at the end of the day, you'll want to be able, you, you've got to be able to measure value going through the application delivery system. Is that what you're seeing too and things that you need, Mark, as, as you know, as you go out as a consultant into the world, is, is that kind of the need functionality you're looking for? Yeah, definitely. I mean, where you see absolute consistency on that chart is visualization across the different types of stakeholders. And that's probably the number one, but you know, pretty much all of these uh, line items are, you know, pretty highly scored and across all the different stakeholders. So that just kind of shows you that you know, the capabilities of value stream that value stream management can provide are useful and needed for many of the you know, different stakeholders involved. So I think really as you're going through the process of, of doing, you know, how, how do you actually get this done? The very next step that you've got to get to is interconnecting the tools because you have tools that are delivering across every delivery pipeline, across every different methodology of pipeline, and you've got to get your, you've got to basically make it be one system. It can't be, uh, it doesn't matter that there's different methodologies. In the same analogy that you've got different cars on the highway, you can still count all the cars on the highway. You can count how big the cars are on the highway. You can, you can look at the methodologies and the things that are going through the system for uh, delivering value in that process. And you need to be able to see it across the entire pipeline all the way from the project planning phase, how that rolls into the uh, feature tools themselves, being able to have insights into the building and, and right on through all the way to operations. And the key here is to be able to normalize the data so that a feature from one delivery pipeline is a, a or a user story a feature is, a, is the same as a user story in another pipeline and that you can correlate these things together that you can then draw a connection between those tools and relate that back to the testing effort that's going on. So you can look at test coverage. You can look at those features as they flow through into uh, release trains and, and how those things flow into production. So you can look at the orchestration, the activities that are done, how that relates to the, um, uh, the change requests as they flow all the way into productions. And, being able to have a common data model where all this data is stored then gives you the ability that not only are you correlating and, and storing this data, but now you can start to report on it. And putting an analytics engine on top of it gives you the ability to have the, uh, 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 you know, look at it over time and start to do more follow your nose kind of analysis. Is this, is this kind of how you see the world too, Mark? Well, uh, yeah, certainly DevOps pipelines are kind of tool soup. You, you know, any one pipeline to really implement automation of CI CD from you know software creation to deployment, it's it's typically 15 to 35 tools, something like that, depending mm -hmm. on what what is it what is actually being done. 
Um, and each every enterprise tends to have quite a large number of pipelines as the choices for tools uh, may vary from one pipeline to the next. So in aggregate, yeah, you really got like tool soup and how do you uh, get visibility on what's really going on at, uh, at, in any one pipeline, let alone at the enterprise level. Um, so having a common data model and a way to integrate tools into a common data structure for visibility and overall orchestration is certainly extremely valuable. And, uh, you know, without it, I don't, uh, without that, it's, it's a little bit chaotic. Uh, so this is a way to kind of reduce the chaos and you know, provide a way that you can evolve individual tool choices within the pipeline over time, but still maintain some common governance and information management uh, rules and capabilities and orchestration at the highest level without having to you know, lock in uh, to any one tool over time. Right. Well, in fact, at that point, you're abstracting yourself and you're basically what you're doing is you, I think of it, it again, like the like the highway. You put guardrails up, use whatever tool you want, but you better have test tools. Use whatever tool for deployment you want, but you you should be using some kind of automated release. Uh, you bet it'd be really good to use some kind of CI tool in there. We don't really care so long as we can pull that data back and then we normalize it. It gives each team to be. Uh, the ability to be autonomous and make their own decisions about what and how they're doing. That's the beauty of this. Um, so interesting you brought up governance and on purpose I put together kind of a, a messy slide because governance is a big deal. Governance really comes down to managing the releases themselves, these delivery trains as they're going through the pipeline. In in the travels of Flutora customers, most of our customers are are fairly large, and really they're they're in the process of delivering software as fast as possible. But there still has to be a lot of compliance, and and I, I mean you got all sorts of issues from quality issues, user acceptance, that things just don't flow from the developer's desktop right into production. And, and and for good reason. In many cases, with regulatory compliance, uh, you know, if if things processes aren't followed, um, it's it can be a uh, a legal and and potentially criminal kind of violation. So these things have to be followed. The challenge is though, you've got to give autonomy to the individual teams. So therefore, as you package and bundle these things down to releases and give the teams the ability to follow these and automate as much as possible as they can of this process, then it enables them to go faster because now you can trust that they're following this process as it goes from the different environments and so forth. Managing these releases is, is the key and, and packaging these things together so that they can flow through the process getting from step to step um, into production is is what's you know that's what's really going to help these things flow through. Hey Jeff, I'd like to comment on this slide. This is the first one that I see from your deck that I'm not 100% with. <laughs> I just have a bee in my bonnet when I see testing is a phase when in reality even your own diagram shows it is end to end. So with DevOps yep. testing is more continuous and uh, you know it actually does show that. But I just want to point out that one of the values of uh, the value stream management affords is that you know testing is really part of a quality assurance strategy and it is really an end-to-end -end, uh, concept it's not just a phase and the neat thing about value stream management is you can aggregate the metrics and data all the way from the beginning through to a release decision point and use testing metrics at each of the gates uh, as you progress through a pipeline I, that's really true. That's uh, a, a good point. And you know, uh, different people have different stages of testing and how they and how they show that. Um, and it, it's a really good point of of uh, of what we're talking about here. Hang on a second. I'm having a presentation problem. So. Flowing this stuff through another big area, you know, not only is it um, a, a challenge in the in the release processes themselves, 
but you've got to be able to take control of the pre-production environments because these are the environments where, as you mentioned, that the testing really happens and as much automated as possible. You've got pipelines that converge on these different. Uh, you think of you know, you know the tributaries that are converging into the rivers that as they go forward, you've got to be able to make sure that these test environments are available and, and configured appropriately. It's not just that the environments are there, but you've got the uh, uh, the proper data, and and then you'll have your follow-on environments where you can have your load testing and and other aspects of the testing process. You know, user acceptance to make sure you can bring users in to make sure they can see uh, that the functionality actually matches what was originally requested. Taking control of these test environments is often one of the one of the biggest efficiency boosts that you can have because so often test environments are just uh, not visible in the value stream. Where do, uh, if I'm looking for a particular set of functionality, where in the delivery process is it? And oftentimes if I want to go see it, it's existing on one of the test environments. In essence, it's probably one of the most visible aspects, uh, most comparable to thinking of it as a production line, even though software is not delivered as a production line. But you could see the software as it's being built by picking the right test environment to be able to dig in. And that's important. In order to uh, help the release management group see application and product line managers uh, see the progress of applications as they're delivered through the product stream, to be able to go see it before it gets to production is pretty critical. Managing these environments, though, has been, I think, the unsung Achilles heel of many delivery pipelines with the bulk of the uh, responsibility lying back on the developers to go fix problems. As, as there's a problem of, of automated builds failing, now somebody points the finger and says, hey, that's your code. Let me go find that. Oh, actually, it was because the environment was misconfigured. And now I'm wasting time on that and wasting application delivery time that I could be focusing on building features. Are you seeing environment problems in, in your travels, Mark? Pretty much everywhere. <laughs> I mean, basically, uh, you know, this addresses several different kinds of problems. One is just setting, you know, getting coordinated uh, between dev and test teams and the infrastructure teams to be able to set up the test environments needed for running particular tests, whatever they happen to be, is one type of problem that, to some extent, can be orchestrated and automated, but uh, often is manual or through tickets and things of that nature. So, you know, being able to orchestrate that is uh, extremely valuable in a more efficient way than just writing tickets. And also, uh, once you have orchestrated a test environment and you run the tests, you know, having a record of what the environment was is really important for audibility, audibility purposes or diagnostic purposes to be able to go back to what to the you know, exact same setup if you need to in order to figure out what was really going on when a test failed. Uh, and in general, you know, to support things like rollbacks, which do occur uh, from time to time, knowing exactly, you know, what the environment was when you roll back. So there's several different kinds of, you know, use cases for this uh, that are quite important in almost every case, that, you know, almost every engagement I've been involved in. Yeah, I know in my in my discussions, I remember with Gary Groover, we did a webinar not too long ago, and and the very beginning of the process of transformation, if was was as you're building your 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 CI process, the very first steps were getting your unit test and your automated test stable, and. It, Oftentimes, the first culprits of that were the test environments were whacked out and not reliable, and they were rigid in, in nature. Oh, and did I mention that they're expensive? So do well with your test environments. Take control of them. So the final, or the you know, the final big area of focus here to to talk about before we get into a bit more of the what is looking at the analytics and the steps of delivery. As you start looking at normalizing the data, you've brought it in, you're, you've got a consistent normalized model for the release trains, you're bringing data in from every delivery pipeline, the, the DevOps ones, the 
more waterfall ones. You're aggregating them together. You can start looking at them. You're breaking them down into phases so that you can add criteria that adds the governance into place. You've got all that governance in a more automated fashion. You've got your testing automated. You're looking at that together. Now you can start to see these things breaking down. Well, guess what? Now you can start to look at it. Well, you've got to slap some reporting and analytics on it. Remember, reporting is right now. It's what's right there. Analytics, though, is, a, is such a big step on top of that. It allows you to follow your nose through the data. Imagine it adding pivot tables on top of all this data that's being captured. You can start to look at some of the most important information. I, I'm really a fan of, of Mick Kirsten's uh, uh, flow metrics and and how they go through because it's not about just delivering code faster it's about delivering value faster and as you look at how long did it take from the time it was approved all the way into production that those metrics will help you and then you can start from an analytics point of view compete that over time and say well are we improving isn't that the most important question that every executive wants to know? We've spent millions. We've invested time. We've bought new tools. Are we doing better than we did before? How is it we're going through our application delivery and can't answer that most important question? And then when we have all these areas of improvement, we can continually manage that improvement because we can then see, well, what's the, what's the next most important area for us to focus on? And focus on typically means re-architect, break dependencies, automate, create that delivery pipeline, make it more visible, and just continuously do better. We can start to compete teams versus each other, which is how you how you motivate in a in a large organization. Hey Jeff, I would like to comment on this one as well, if you don't mind. Yes, because uh, what, what when I see this chart, what it what brings it what brings to what comes to my mind is the there's a couple of tenants that uh, DevOps folks talk about a lot, you know, shift left and accelerate things. Uh, but the, one of the tenants that I like to talk about in addition to that is relevance. And you did use the word relevant at one point. Um, to me, you know, you can shift left all you like, you can accelerate all you like, but you know, what happens is you get essentially a tsunami of activities and information mm -hmm. that are trying to happen all at the same time as you push things into a shorter and shorter interval. And you just, I don't care how much automation you have at some point, you know, you've got to say, all right, wait a minute. What if all of this is really relevant? It's important that we should deal with it at this stage and some things can happen later, although all the information needs to be aggregated over the entire pipeline. So this again is where value stream management can add a lot of, uh, you know, value um, and just helping with, with the tenant of relevance. Absolutely. You know, where, what's the point of this particular exercise as I get a new DevOps engineer? I love that. That's absolutely the point. So getting into a bit of, well, what's, what's, you know, how do you, how do you actually do this? <laughs> okay. We got into the why we got into the how. So what, what does this mean? What, where does this go? Mark, do you want to talk a bit about this and then I'll, I'll kind of take a next step. Well, I, we, covered this in some ways already, but yeah, I mean, DevOps itself is, well, it's mostly, you know, about tool chains and orchestrating pipelines and getting data, you know, for people to be able to figure out what, you know, whether the processes are working and, and the people as well, you know, value stream management, is kind of a layer over and above that. So any solution for value stream management needs to be able to consume, you know, ingress data and then act on that data. Uh, just like if you didn't have, uh, a tool, if you like, for value stream management, then people are having to do this. And, you know, th they do that by analyzing the data, well, those process analytics, and then determining, you know, what to do with that result uh, in terms of business outcomes for the value stream. So at the heart of it, you know, the how is turning, you know, a manual uh, layer, the people layer, over and above the tool chains into a more systemized, operationalized layer that um, can actually be, you know, optimize things that otherwise would be very difficult to do because of it's just people work. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, at Platora, of course, I, hey, I'm a vendor. Guess what we do? We that, This is what we do. And that's why we love value stream <laughs> managers. We, we have a, at Platora, we have a platform that manages the value stream. We, 
we have the different layers that integrate into the application delivery pipelines. We've got a really strong integration hub and transformation layer that can in, that pulls in data into the cloud. We're a, a, a cloud, a SaaS-based platform. And as we pull this data in, we normalize it and provide it in a way to where you can take action on the items that are in there. Correlating data between the uh, uh, different areas and tools in the tool chain itself that act upon the entire delivery ecosystem. And we take this data all the way from the agile planning phase into the ALM type tools, moving them forward all the way through, correlating that back with test data, giving the ability to do things like requirements traceability, looking at the impact matrices of applications to environments to uh, delivery, giving the ability to see soup to nuts, you know, the, the all the way through process of every single pipeline. Where it's particularly interesting is where there are dependencies between these pipelines. As these as these pipelines converge, regardless if they're automated or not, regardless if they're waterfall or a continuous integration and continuous delivery, we can bring those things together and correlate them in the in the process. We do that by um, uh, adding layers of governance and analytics and insights so that wherever you are in your delivery process and your, and your digital transformation, we can take that, help you point to the next areas of improvement and make improvements on it. <clears throat> the two, uh, really the, the main areas that we look at is, is helping create these release trains that you coordinate the different pipelines into. And as you do so, you can take this uh, whole scoping and project organization exercise and, and put them in um, into self-service type releases where people put in what they're going to deliver on the train and, and get on the train. And, and there's still governance and oversight. We give a method for disciplined at you know, discipline DevOps throughout the process because you can easily see what's going where. We can link it all the way back to the change requests that were made uh, initially, which is kind of the point. So that release planning um, enables us to reach across teams from the different tools and, and interconnect them. And as I was talking about, break these things up into different phases and gates with the gates being the criteria to move forward. And those gates are automated, they're manual, uh, anywhere in between, any number of criteria, really ensuring that <clears throat> you know you can incorporate quality metrics, you can incorporate any other code coverage or, or any other kind of governance things as it moves through the process and help mature wherever the next constraint is that needs to be solved. That release uh, you know, uh, is important. Then the next important thing to do as part of that process is to orchestrate the, the number of, of uh, you know, automated and manual tasks as they go through the process. So that as you're looking at the delivery, you can um, see exactly where you're at in one view and, and be able to drill through everything. Then we have another aspect of the test environments where we have a whole self-service enabled test environment management where these environments can be provisioned manually or automated and self-service request them and, and the provisioning will happen. We can even manage it from a chargeback perspective. Still, we're in, in today's world, we're still the majority, almost 70% of environments are still internal to organizations. They're not in the cloud. They might be virtualized, but they're not all created uh, in their entirety by code. And while we want to get there, let which one should we take there? Well, part of the point is, unless you get your arms around test environments, you'll never know. And when you bring all these things together, you can start to get truly a self-service environment of your application delivery. You can start to to track the outcomes of application delivery and ultimately end up with analyzing a value stream through the different processes and then pulling back data of that application delivery that's coming from the tools, not an expectation, but you know, get an idea of what's actually happening throughout those tools. So I'll stop here and 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 we'll uh, 
we'll take some time for some questions. Yeah, looks like we have about 10 minutes or so that we can go through audience <clears throat> questions. Um, to everybody who has uh, asked whether the uh, webinar is going to be available on demand, yes, uh, we will be sending out an email this afternoon that will include a link that you'll be able to access the webinar on demand. And um, I believe the slides are actually going up on SlideShare as well. So um, plenty of ways to get this uh, information later on. Um, but there's time if you have a question for either Jeff or Mark, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And uh, let's go ahead and dive right on in. Uh, first question here, uh, is value stream management a new concept? <laughs> Hey Jeff, do you want me to take that one, or do you want to take it? Um, I, go ahead, and I'll. Well, I think maybe we both can respond to that one. Why don't you start? Okay. Yeah. So I was introduced to this concept of value stream management about four years ago at a DevOps summit in New York. I happened to be manning, helping man a booth, uh, a couple booths down the aisle from uh, Plutoria, Plutora, and I. And it was at that point I, I started to become familiar with value stream management. But you know, I did a little um, study beyond that, and I, you know, I re realized that value stream management has been around for some time as a concept. It was actually created uh, as part of lean management and manufacturing optimization methodologies and so on. But the application of value stream management to DevOps, I think, is relatively new. Uh, more and more people are starting to become familiar with it, and hopefully, this webinar will, you know, help help uh, share the information and get the word out. Yeah, you know, I the idea of value stream mapping, I remember I first heard it uh, reading, I, I think it was a book by Kent Beck, you know, way back in the day in, in my programming days. And and it was kind of an interesting thing that I kind of blew off until I actually went through the process of, of in trying to improve delivery at an organization I was in. And, and it was like, ah, oh, man, why didn't I just draw this out the way that, you know, it's always that case when you go through this. Management of the actual value stream, um, I, I think has, has, you know, really come forward. It it's now seems to be the time where everyone's talking about the analytics. And the only way you have that is if you can actually manage the whole value stream itself. So is it new? No, I think these lean manufacturing principles have been around for a long time. And let's just apply them to software. Is software a factory? No, because you know, as much as we'd like to draw the the processes step to step, we we all know that it's it's a little more uh, uh, messy than that. But uh, the principles are still the same. And, and that's where it does come in. All right, great. The next question, um, uh, does value stream management dive uh, into individual user stories or is it more at the features and epic levels? I, I can jump into that a little bit. The, the point of value stream management is to look at value being delivered. And so value being delivered ultimately will get broken down into some key aspects. So oftentimes you'll put together user stories into epics and and sure there's you can you know from the planning side you'll you'll put a group of user stories as an epic that has a value applied to it. So I can actually say hey if we had if we have these series of epics and 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 you know that combine into initiative that has a certain monetary value to the business in terms of expected revenue and so forth. But frankly, uh, most companies don't break down the features as, well, this particular feature is going to add this much value to the business, uh, you know, from a revenue point of view, from a top, top end. What we do see, though, is there's still interesting information to be gathered by seeing how fast features flow through the system itself. And highly recommend, like I said, the Project to Product book by by Mick is is an awesome read. The value of looking at features as they flow through the system, the value of evaluating, um, you know, how long does it take, and are we improving our feature flow? How how well are we doing compared to how big we thought that thing was going through? How well are we improving? the flow of releases through the system as an aggregate of, of, of epics and features across different teams. Um, all those are interesting from a value stream management point of view that are metrics that you should be looking at. Hey Jeff, maybe I could comment as well on that. Uh, just, I 
of course, I agreed with everything you just said, but uh, I think in general, whether you're looking at user stories or epics or, you know, other things, it's just a matter of granularity. And, you know, what you pick out to analyze and keep track of is really going to be situational dependent, depending on the value stream and what you decide are the key metrics for whatever your value stream is. Uh, that's generally the idea. So certainly you can go down to whatever level of granularity, you know, you, you need to to support your value stream. Yeah, that's a really good point, you know, and and here's the funny part about it is it, this is why you need an analytics engine on top of this. It's not like it, you might today be interested in features. Tomorrow you might be interested in initiatives. The next day you might be interested in releases because depending upon the situation, you need to be able to answer all three. The difference being when you have the data, you need a, a visualization engine to be able to follow your nose. And that's exactly what Tableau does for us with our partnership with them. All this data gets fed into an analytics. I, I think we have, a, I, I, I don't even know how many different data cubes in, in our data mart we've got, but it, it's, it's a lot. And so whatever you put all this data in, make sure that you can um, put an analytics engine on top of it so that you can not care and say, well, today we're gonna look at it this way. Tomorrow we're gonna look at it another way. That's the point. All right, we're about four minutes to the top of the hour. I think we have time for one more question here. Most advanced IT organizations do continuous deployment. Uh, AWS deploys changes every second, for instance. How does that match with managing releases? And then governance in parentheses. That's a great, great point. And I'll, I'll throw in here, Mark, you'll have comments too. You know, What's funny is that in the old world, in the old school, releases are an aggregate of of functionality that have to, you know, have massive management and so forth. In the world of continuous deployment, releases are much more fine grain. In fact, you start looking at the feature that goes through the pipeline. In a continuous deployment kind of world going into AWS, it's still interesting to look at those things. Normalizing the data though, what would you call that set of stuff as it flows in? Well, you're still releasing stuff. And so while that release is a lot smaller in, in scope, it's still a release that's going out. When you would look at from an operational point of view, the operations team, still is going to see that thing as a release. And the fact that it's all automated and still checks all the box is the point. It's still following the, the best practices processes. It's still ensuring that you're compliant. You still have audit, you know, auditable steps. You're still adhering to the security practices. It's just the fact that they're all automated and small in scope. That's more efficient and that's good, but there's still releases. Um, from my point of view, um, <clears throat> basically what you're talking about is a perfect storm where you've got basically, you know, a lot more information occurring at a higher speed. So you're having to deal with a lot of volume of data very quickly. So if you have a failed release, a failed deployment, you need to know that. And the way you're going to know that is by aggregating a lot of information very quickly and being able to act on it very quickly. So this idea of you know, being able to aggregate data and visualize it and provide orchestrated actions is, you know, even more important, you know, the value stream concept is very important in the rapid deployment environments. All right, great. We uh, unfortunately have uh, just a few minutes left, so we will have to close out the Q&A now. I do want to let folks know that if you did submit a question and we didn't get to it, the folks at Plutor and Trace3 um, will be getting a copy of all of the questions. So I'm sure somebody from the organization will be more than happy to follow up with you offline and get your question answered. So I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. I uh, also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or you just want to listen to it again, or you want to share it with somebody else, um, you will be receiving an email this afternoon that includes a link to take you to the webinar on demand. We're also going to be posting the webinar on the devops.com website. So you can always go there to check it out. Just go into the webinar section on demand, and it should be right there. While you're there, please uh, take a look around at the other webinars that we have, both upcoming and on demand. Hopefully there'll be one or two that pique your interest. Uh, Jeff Kyes and Mark Hornbeek, both of you, thank you so much for giving such a great presentation. Great stuff today. Thanks again, guys. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. And this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.